In the previous videos, we discussed that digoxin has got two important effects. Firstly, it has got a positive inotropic effect on the heart, which makes it useful in the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We also discussed that digoxin has got a vagomimetic effect on the AV nod and therefore is useful in the management of such conditions as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Now it's worth investing some time into developing at least a rudimentary understanding on atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter as this would help us to get a better appreciation of how digoxin is useful in the management of these entities. Now atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter are conditions where the atrial rates are very high, pathologically high. For example in atrial fibrillation the atrial rates can vary from 300 to 600 impulses per minute while in atrial flutter the atrial rates may vary from 250 to 350 impulses per minute. Now there is only one electrical window by which impulses are conducted from the atria down to the ventricles and this is the atrioventricular nod. Now when the atrial rates become excessive the AV nod prevents many atrial impulses from passing down to the ventricles and thank God that it does. Because if the ventricles were allowed to beat at these excessive rates they would not get time to relax and if the ventricles do not relax they do not fill with blood. If they don't fill with blood they are not going to eject any blood and therefore the cardiac output would fall sharply vital organs would be acutely deprived of oxygen and blood and this would cause multi-organ failure. Of course, uh, we discussed that this doesn't often happen because the AV not prevents many impulses from reaching the ventricles. The manner in which the AV not conducts impulses from the atria to the ventricles varies in atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation and these differences may be due to the differences in the pathophysiology of these entities. Now, in atrial flutter, abnormal impulses are generated in the atria. But in general, these impulses stimulate the atria in a fixed and predictable manner. On the other hand, in atrial fibrillation, there is nothing fixed and predictable here. There is completely uncoordinated atrial activation, completely unpredictable, highly chaotic. The atrial rates in atrial flutter varies from 250 to 350 impulses per minute while in atrial fibrillation it varies from 300 to 600 impulses per minute. But as we discussed, the AV not prevents many of these impulses from being conducted down to the ventricles. Now, in atrial flutter, because the impulses are generated or rather because the impulses stimulate the atria in a fixed and predictable manner, it may so happen that the AV nod begins conducting impulses from the atria to the ventricles in a fixed conduction ratio. Most commonly the conduction ratio is a 2 is to 1 ratio. This would simply mean that if the atria were to beat at a rate of say 300 impulses per minute, the ventricle would beat at a rate of 150 impulses or beats per minute. So for every two atrial beats the ventricle would beat only once. So that's what we mean by a 2 is to 1 conduction ratio. On the other hand in atrial fibrillation such conduction ratios never occur. The ventricular rate varies from 100 to 160 beats per minute. In atrial flutter we often encounter situations where the atrial and ventricular rhythms are regular. Such a condition never arises in atrial fibrillation. In fact, the hallmark of atrial fibrillation is an irregularly irregular pulse. Now, it may come as a surprise to the beginner, but the cornerstone of the treatment for both atrial flutter and fibrillation involve antithrombotic therapy in the form of antiplatelet and anticoagulant drugs. Now this actually isn't very surprising because uh, 
if we were to recall the atrial rates in atrial flutter and fibrillation, in atrial flutter it varies from 250 to 350 impulses per minute and in atrial fibrillation the atrial rate can go up to 600 beats per minute. Now at these fast and furious rates the atria fail to contract effectively rather we we come across futile fibrillatory movements quivering movements now these sort of movements are not sufficient to effectively pump the blood forcefully into the ventricles the result is stasis of blood within the atria now if we are familiar with the virtue triad we would be familiar with those conditions that predispose a patient to the development of a prothrombotic state. These include endothelial injury, hypercoagulability of blood and altered blood flow. By altered blood flow we mean either stasis or turbulence of blood flow and as we just saw atrial flutter and fibrillation predispose the patient to stasis of blood in the atria and therefore predispose the patient to a prothrombotic state. This explains why antithrombotic therapy is a very important component in the treatment of atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. We now come to the concept of rate control. Now, both atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are cardiac arrhythmias and therefore it is logical that rhythm control with antiarrhythmic drugs should be beneficial in both these conditions. Indeed, rhythm control is an important strategy that may be pursued in some patients. However, adopting a rhythm control strategy is not suitable for many patients and hence in such subset of patients a rate control strategy is preferred over a rhythm control strategy. Now in a rate control strategy Drugs are administered which makes it more difficult for impulses to pass from the atria down to the ventricles. These drugs are called negative dromotropic drugs. Dromotropy refers to conduction velocity. By making it more difficult for impulses to pass from the atria down to the ventricles, we achieve a better control of the ventricular rate and it's important to remember that ventricular rate is the heart rate. By achieving better control over the heart rate, we reduce symptoms and increase the efficiency of the heart as a pump. Right, so in rate control strategy, we administer negative dromotropic drugs. This ensures that the ventricular rate or the heart rate is kept within normal limits. Symptoms reduce and cardiac efficiency increases. But it is extremely important to remember that rate lowering agents have little to no effect on the rhythm of the heart. In other words, the atria will continue to flutter or fibrillate as the case may be. Right, so irrespective of whether rhythm control or a rate control strategy is adopted, Daily antithrombotic therapy is required to prevent thromboembolic events. Okay, so long term management of atrial fibrillation and even atrial flutter involves the use of antithrombotic agents, rhythm control using antiarrhythmic drugs, and rate control. The drugs most commonly used for rate control include beta blockers the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers namely diltiazem and verapamil, cardiac glycosides like digoxin and amiodarone. Now, if we were to look at these drugs which are used for rhythm control, beta blockers are class 2 antiarrhythmic drugs, the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs, Digoxin comes under the so-called unclassifiable antiarrhythmic drugs and amiodarone comes under class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs. So all these drugs which are used for rate control are in fact antiarrhythmic drugs. But it's important to note 
that when these drugs are given for rate control, they have very little effect on the rhythm of the heart. The main purpose of using these drugs is to control the rate. The first line agents used for rate control include the beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers, verapamil and diltiazem. But there are situations where verapamil and diltiazem are not at all preferred. And the most important example for this would be heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So, if there is a patient with atrial fibrillation or flutter with coexistent heart failure, the use of digoxin becomes appropriate. It's worth noting that digoxin adequately controls the heart rate at rest, but the ability of digoxin to control ventricular rate during exercise is quite limited. When combined with beta blockers, however, the combination becomes more effective in controlling the ventricular rate even during exercise. It's worth noting that in patients without systolic heart failure, the use of digoxin for rate control may not be such a good idea. Also in patients with a vagotonic form of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, digoxin use may be associated with worse outcomes. So these are two situations in which digoxin may not be such a good idea. Right. When talking about the dose of digoxin in atrial fibrillation, it's worth talking about the concept of loading dose. When a constant dose of a drug is given, it would take four to five half-lives for the drug to reach the desired plasma concentration. In the case of digoxin, the half-life is 36 hours, which would mean that it would take seven to 10 days for the desired concentration, desired plasma concentration to be reached. This may be too long a period, especially when we consider the treatment of atrial fibrillation. So in such situations, we may administer a loading dose. So what exactly is a loading dose? This involves a series of doses given at the onset of therapy with the aim or intention of achieving the target concentration much more rapidly. The use of loading dose of digoxin is recommended in the treatment of AF, atrial fibrillation. Right, so if we were to use the IV route, the loading dose of digoxin in atrial fibrillation would be 0.25 milligrams every two hours until a total dose of one milligram is achieved. The maintenance dose would be 0.125 to 0.25 milligrams per day. If we were to give digoxin by the oral route, the loading dose would be up to 1.25 milligrams over a period of 24 hours and this total dose may be divided over three to four divided doses. The maintenance dose would be 0.125 to 0.25 milligrams per day. Now, even when administered in such a manner, the onset of digoxin would require more than an hour and it would take up to six hours for the, for the action to peak. Therefore, digoxin may not be an optimal agent when rapid rate control is desired. Right, so if we were to compare the efficacy of rate control for atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation, we would see that rate control is more challenging in atrial flutter. By comparison, it is much more easy to achieve in atrial fibrillation. And this is why the role of digoxin in atrial flutter ex is extremely limited. But if there is a patient with atrial fibrillation with coexistent heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, digoxin may have a much larger role to play. Finally, digoxin is commonly initiated and maintained at a dose of 0.125 to 0.25 milligrams per oral daily. There is no need for using loading doses of digoxin in heart failure.